Ladies and gentlemen, and now, now, for your dying, 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 dying. listen, 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 tight, tight. Are they freaking out yet? Is the scene right? Nobody there yet, so nobody can freak. Okay. <laughs> well, let's do a screen. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the Gospel of Matthew, we are now in year A of the ELCA's calendar, right, year A, please tell me that's the truth. That is the truth. Year A, okay. Year A. It's um, not just the ELCA, right? No, no, it's not. You're absolutely right. We'll, We'll get into that. Um, it's new to me. <laughs> I'll say it that way. Um, so the gospel for year A is Matthew. So Pastor Dwayne and I thought, well, we'll 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 talk about. Uh, actually, it was going to be Pastor Dwayne, and I was going to help him, and then he said, "You're so good at this. Why don't you just do it?" <laughs> so. Yep, yep. It was um, a legitimate reason. I ran out of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and he did prepare his part, so it's it's all embedded here. So we'll see it shortly. Um, but here's the deal. There's Matthew, and it's wrapped up in all these layers of context. So. History uh, of Christianity, the early church, Judaism, Rome. Uh, where does Matthew fit in the New Testament canon? And where does it fit in the liturgical year and the lectionary history and all these things where we find Matthew, but if we don't dig into the background, we're not going to understand um, as much as we might when we hear it every service for the rest of the, this uh Year A. By the way, we have the entire lectionary here. Year A, B, and C. Uh, you can. You don't have to be a reverend to buy these. <laughs> you don't have to have right reverend in your email. Um, I. I'm a lay person, and I got these online. Ebay. Yeah. Ebay. They yeah. were used. They were, they were used. Uh, but uh, anybody can have them. Okay, so here we are in. Uh, uh -oh, yeah. Stop working. Okay, here we are. We're in year A of A, B, and C. Year A, the gospel is Matthew. Year B, it is Mark. Year C, it's Luke. And John is scattered about. So, uh, mostly in the Easter season, if I recall, is where John is. I believe he is. Okay. So, the lectionary. First, what is the lectionary? All you diehard Lutherans. You were born and conceived in Lutheranism. To you, lection, you know what lectionary is. I was a Baptist boy. Yes, ma'am. I hear you. It's all racist. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it is. It's, it's actually a good word. But anyway. <laughs> well, I don't mean it that way. But I mean, I can, please don't assume we're all Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, in both Judaism and Christianity, a lectionary is a book that contains portions of the Bible appointed to be read on particular days and in particular years. Um, this uh, word lectionary is also used for a list of such scripture lessons. So all the scripture lessons in year A are in a lectionary. 
I, I'm assuming you could also buy one that just has them all in one volume. Yes, you can. Okay. And the psalms included as well. There you go. Yeah, the, the idea, though, of, of these readings like that is that we will cover all of Scripture without reading every Scripture word. There you go. Microsoft Word likes the word lectionary, but it does not like the word lecture. So you have to add it to your dictionary. But in either case, it means reading or public reading. Okay. So the early Christians adopted these public reading of the scriptures because it was already a pattern in Judaism. So Acts 14, on the Sabbath day, Paul and his companions went into the synagogue. This is someplace in Macedonia, I believe, maybe in Greek, Greece. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the officials of the synagogue said, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, give it. So Paul stood up and preached. Got to be careful offering a pulpit to people. <laughs> so this was a, a pre-established pattern within Judaism and Christianity. They didn't even use the word Christianity or Christian. They were followers of Judaism. So they just went on with the exact same structure of the service. I'm not sure what gesture Paul made. <laughs> but it was probably a loving one. <laughs> okay. Also then this is a this is a poll right from an early church service. <laughs> and Paul says Timothy uh, to Timothy, until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of scripture to exhorting and to teaching. So one translation of this uh, says actually, until I come give attention to the selected reading of the day. So what scripture readings did Paul have? Primarily the Old Testament because the New Testament was not yet. And so they did a reading from the law and a reading from the prophets either major or minor, and sometimes a reading from the psalm. So while this basic practice of reading scriptures and preaching from it was common, what was read and how much was read was not common. Every little church, as they developed across the Mediterranean basin, kind of did their own thing. Um, in some places, there was what was called a continuous reading from Sunday to Sunday until the book was finished. Some areas of Spain and France used lessons made from a mosaic of scripture, piecing together short selections from various parts. Some churches used harmonies of the gospels as those developed over time. Uh, and some places read two lessons each Sunday, others read as many as four. Overall, the phrase um, Lexio Continua was the pattern where they would start reading a letter or a book on one Sunday and wherever they stopped the next Sunday, they would pick it up. So continuous reading. Now, um, good St. Jerome said, yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, I think, I'm not really sure about this, but I think that in the Jewish tradition, the Torah is a one-year cycle for the Torah. This is the first Bible of the Yeah. Old Testament. But that, and, and there is a special day where in the, in the uh, liturgy, actually, in the, in the synagogue, where the, the celebrate finished of reading that Torah through its own. Sure. Yeah. And cool. to, to reflect back on that, the Psalms in some Bibles are divided into the five books of the Torah. The 150 psalms are equally divided, and the assumption is, is that there's a tradition that those psalms go with that book in terms of being read together. Oh, harmony of the gospels. We're, we'll talk about this in a couple minutes, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Sin means uh, together, optic scene, so common perspective. 90% um, of Mark 
is in Luke and in Matthew. So uh, they, there's a harmony of that. Now, details differ from book to book. Some of the details differ. Some of them are exactly the same. But they all had a common source. And that source is called the Book of Q, which comes from the German word quell, which means uh, source. So, um, good Saint Jerome, pictured there in the study with the lion. You will always see pictures of Jerome with the lion. There's got to be a story there. I do not know what it is. But anyway, um, he finally says, enough of this, everybody doing their own thing. And he creates a common lectionary in 471 for use of the churches, started in Italy and then worked its way out until everybody was using it. And then about 300 years later, King Charlemagne said, I like the liturgy. I just don't like the long bits. So he excised, um, shortened many of the epistle and gospel readings and, and took out the Old Testament readings as well. So thank you, Charlie. Um, <laughs> then Trinity Sunday was added in the 13th century. And finally, the kind of lectionary was established as the historic lectionary um, in the 13th century, which is a long time after it started. Now, Luther, of course, had things to say about this. Um, during the Reformation, some lectionary use was completely discontinued. Uh, some reformers just threw the baby out with the bath and did away with public reading uh, in the service. Others went back to Lectio Continua. Uh, in keeping with the Reformation principle, uh, and I'm quoting Duane here, um, with, in keeping with the Reformation principle not to fix anything that isn't broken, Martin Luther retained the historic lectionary with only slight revisions made by the Lutherans for Proverbs 25 and 26 for eschatological, eschatological lessons uh, to be con uh, connected with the end of life and the end of all things, and then the relocation of Transfiguration Sunday. I love Luther because he never hesitated to speak his mind. <laughs> I love what he says here. After the collect, which is the, the main prayer in a Catholic mass, after a collect, the epistle is read. Certainly the time has come, has not yet come to attempt revision here, as nothing unevangelical is read, except those parts from the epistles of Paul, in which faith is taught, are read, are read only rarely, while the exhortations to morality are most frequently read. The epistles seem to have been chosen by a singularly unlearned and superstitious advocate of works. <laughs> but for the service, those sections in which, Christ, which faith in Christ is taught should have been given preference. The latter was certainly considered more often in the Gospels by whoever it was who chose these lessons. In the meantime, the sermon in the vernacular will have to supply what is left. <laughs> so, uh, our good Reverend uh, Martin lets us know. So, um, for 400 years, that was good enough for the Lutherans. It was all cool. And then in the mid-60s, as a response to uh, the Vatican Second Council, a ecumenical group came together to create this uh, committee called the Consultation on Common Texts. And by 1983, the CCT had finalized a three-year common lectionary, and they put it out there for people to try this out, give it a test drive, kick the wheel, see how it works. And nine years later, they finally then published a revised common lectionary, which is what we all have and use. Uh, and there were I want to say about 23 different denominations that were involved in that process. So it wasn't just Lutherans and Catholics. There was a truckload of people and who knew some Baptists were part of that. <laughs> so, okay. Now, how does the lectionary fit with the church year? Um, oh, just as a quick 
aside. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We'll come back to that in a second. The church year consists of five seasons, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, and then the time after Pentecost, which used to be called ordinary time. And then at some point people said, that's so lame. Let's call it the time after Pentecost. So chosen lectionary selections from Matthew, Mark, or Luke are meant to highlight important themes or ideas inherent in each of the church seasons. As we progress through year A, you will see passages from Matthew in each church season. And the, the, one of the reasons I bring this up, so I was telling Keith and Jim earlier that um, I never knew there was a liturgical calendar. And when I found out there was a liturgical calendar and that you could follow the life of Christ through the year, I thought, um, there's, there's a gentle way to say this, I'm sure. I, I was upset. Why? Huh? Why? Because I felt like my church leaders that I had given my life to for all of my life up to that point never mentioned it. And yet, outside of our little insular little church group, there was a whole world of Christianity that was marching to the drum of a liturgical calendar, and I was obliviously unaware. I do not like being ignorant. What? And I felt they kept me in ignorance. Yes, ma'am. What? When you find out, you know, I thought that the when I discovered that, it was a wonderful thing. Because I knew that that Christians in all parts of the world yeah. Yeah. were on that same day reading the same yeah. scriptures that I was hearing. So it was a, a, it was a new yeah. wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah. So even though I had been part of it before, <laughs> when I discovered that, it was truly really remarkable. Yeah, and I think maybe that's part of in the creed when we say, I believe in the communion of the saints. Uh, Part of what that means. That's a phrase in the creed I really wrestled with trying to understand. What does this mean? Communion of the saints. I don't, except if we all follow the calendar and we all read the same readings, we'll all get different things, but we're doing it in step with yeah. back to other saints. I can go to uh, into Seattle to the cathedral, the same thing you did. Yeah. Yeah. I just hear those verses. And yep. Right. 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 And quick interjection, not only the same lessons, but much of the same liturgy. And hymns. And, and sometimes hymn selections, because the revised common lectionary folk got into creating a uniform set of confessional wow. prayers. They updated the Lord's Prayer that we say, the modernized version, etc. You hear that, you hear many liturgical features in different brands of churches all over the world on the same day. There. And one of the things that I found is that the uh, lectionary is a tool which drives scripture rather than what I want to read into it. So mm -hmm. often, uh, if sure. you don't have that kind of a structure, uh, you're thinking about something and oh let's see we're gonna you know right. and and so the 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 read it isolates rather than exegesis all of the scriptures is going to lead you to it rather than reading into it something that is not really there. Yeah. My roommate in college uh, you learn the word exegesis. It became a swear. Ex Jesus. <laughs> I think to see the difference in denominations, uh, uh, some friends of ours worshiped at a non denominational church, even though they had been raised in a liturgical church. And, um, 
and we got together with them at Christmas time, and their pastor had been preaching on a series on Revelation. And very sequentially, ponderously moving through Revelation for a full year. Come Christmas time, he didn't vary. <laughs> and so on Christmas Eve, and on Christmas, I, they probably didn't have Christmas Day services, but on Christmas Eve, there was a reading from Revelation. Oh, no. And, you know, that, that, that struck me as, hmm, uh, what's wrong with that picture? Yeah, right? yeah. Well, and then when you, you finally get the courage to ask a friend or a relative to come to Christmas Eve service with you, and they get a dose of apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, within the church year, these days, do the readings on those days do not change. Through every cycle, A, B, and C, those are all the same. So whether it's Nativity, Epiphany, Ash Wednesday, whatever, those readings are the same, and many of them are from the Gospel of John, because mm -hmm. he's not part of the three-year cycle except during these days. Last thing about the lectionary is the difference between complementary or semi-continuous reading plans. Um, Dwayne explained this to me because I was lost and didn't understand, but a complementary selection of readings is where if the, in the Old Testament talks about humility, then in the Psalm there'll be something about humility, and then in the Epistles there'll be something about humility, and in the Gospel reading there'll be something about humility. So they're complementary. Whereas continuous, semi-continuous just means if you started in John 2 this week, then you're going to be in John 3 next week. It's continuous. Is it, is that, am I saying that? Good. Okay. Good. And how are those utilized in the same literature? way? Same way. It shows up in the season of Pentecost only, as I recall. So then the liturgical committee of the church has the uh, task or the pastor has the task to choose whether to stay with a complementary series of readings or a continuous series. Through what? Through what? During the time of Pentecost. Yeah. yeah. Through the longest season of the church. And the the um, the only place where it gets interesting is if you were supposed to be doing a semi-continuous reading from the pulpit and you do a complementary reading from the pulpit, it can be confusing. So I've done that. Read the wrong reading because I pulled it out of the complementary batch instead of the continuous batch. Um, no one knew but the pastor. <laughs> so he was cool. He just told me later, you know, don't do that. <laughs> so anyway, okay. Let's talk about the context of Judaism. Early Christianity and the, and the New Testament, and so our book of Matthew, emerged from the larger context of Judaism. All the authors of the New Testament, except um, Luke, were Jewish. So first century Judaism was really actually very diverse. Um, within the context of the Roman rule, which started about uh, 63 BCE. So the Essenes were Jewish fundamentalists that advocated withdrawal from mainstream society and established monastic communities out near the Dead Sea. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were written and prepared by Essenes. And we've, we, we found them in 1946 or whatever. Um, there's some speculation that Jesus might have belonged to the Essene community. Pharisees were likely uh, rich, some kind of nobility or minor nobility, uh, remained within society, but advocated a strict observance of Jewish law. So as a party of religious purists who concentrated on control of religions rather than political affairs, they were very uh, holier than thou, and thus often got crosswise with Jesus. The zealots, opposed Roman rule through armed insurrection. They were the 3% militia of their day. And then Sadducees were a wealthy arist aristocratic group and collaborated with, uh, with Roman rule. They controlled about 50% of the seats in the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish Supreme Council. 
Their religious position was conservative, uh, even to the extent of refusing to accept any revelations beyond the five books of the Torah. They didn't read the prophets or the Psalms in their daily readings. They just did the Torah. Now, most Jews were not part of any of these actual groups, but were cultural Jews, just like many Americans are cultural Christians. And they were resigned to Roman rule, but hoping for a deliverance of some sort. So what they had in common was this uh, covenantal theology, which really uh, had three common threads. The first was radical monotheism. Compared with other world religions at the time, uh, everybody had multiple gods except the Jews. The Jews had one God. And then promise and hope. Most Jews were steeped in at least in a cultural appreciation of their people's history with, with God, which involved both the promises God gave them and their consequent hope that these promises would be fulfilled someday. And then lastly was observance to some degree. Almost all Jews were observant of the religious laws, at least to some extent, Sabbath keeping, eating kosher, things like that, which were just so, so deeply part of their culture that they did it, but not even for religious reasons. They just did it. And here is where you have um, some of these things that Phil is talking about. You, you can see them as they start showing up, these themes start showing up in the readings in Matthew mm -hmm. in particular. Yes. Yeah. In fact, well, related to radical monotheism and observance, um, Matthew quotes the Old Testament more often than any other writer in the New Testament, or at least more than any other gospel. Okay. The context of early Christianity. So Jesus was born around 4 BC, killed around year 30. Um, they were not called Christians. And uh, the followers were, were not called Christianity. In fact, they're called Christians twice in the New Testament, and neither Jesus or Paul used those words. Christianity at the time was considered an offset of Judaism, and they were simply called the way, or followers of the way, or followers of the anointed, or party of the anointed. Like we say, are you a Democrat, or a Republican, or a Libertarian? They would say, oh, we're followers of the way. Of the anointed. There's a diaspora described in Acts 8 1 where it says, Then the persecution came and everybody spread out all up and down the coast, all over uh, the uh, Eastern Med. And when that happened, they took Christianity with them, and probably within a very short time, less than 20 years, maybe less than 10 years, it had begun to include Gentiles along with the Jews. And the term Christian was a juridical, juridical term um, and applied to followers of Jesus actually by Roman magistrates uh, uh, and uh, other Jewish magistrates. So it was, a, it was a legal term. And then it was, if you belonged to this group called Christians, it was sufficient to be accused, just belonging was sufficient to be accused of breaking the law and being judged or punished by Rome, even punished by death. Simply saying, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. It's like me going on the street saying, yeah, I'm a pedophile. It's cool, it's cool. Didn't, didn't work. So the context of Rome, four points here about the context of Rome. Rome was politically oppressive. It was a society ruled by a few uh, monarchies and aristocracies, the powerful, the wealthy, the elites. The vast majority of the populace had no vote, no say, no power. Now this is, this is actually, I think is hard for us to recognize and get our head around. We joke about not having power, but we have tremendous liberty and freedom, and we also have the vote. No one in their day had the vote. So we have elite political classes and elite political families. Think of the 
Kennedys and Roosevelt's and Bush's. But just about anyone can run for public office, get in, and have impact. Marjorie Taylor Greene, George Santos. In Rome, those people wouldn't have made it to the door. But here, they get to be part of the House of Representatives. Number two, it was um, economically exploitive. They spread out. The Roman army took Rome wherever they went, and they spread out specifically to conquer and rob other nations. The ruling elites structured society and the economy to their benefits. About two thirds of annual production went to the top few percent of the population. 90% of the population was poor and had a life expectancy about half that of the wealthy. And about 20% were actually slaves. Not race-based slaves like we know or like Britain and America and other European countries conducted. Anybody could be a slave. Didn't matter what race you were. So, I'll tell you a story about this. Why, this. why this makes me think about slavery. A few years ago, I had a colleague who took a group of about 25 students to uh, North and South Carolina. He had gotten his degree at Clemson, so he was very familiar with the Southeast. So he took this group of students down to, to view things, how things are done in the Southeast, and historical gardens, and you know, all kinds of stuff like that. First day of the tour, he gets bitten by a, a copperhead snake. And he's immediately hospitalized in intensive care for three days. And the students are just like, what do we do here? Now he had a grad student TA with him, and she kind of corralled them for she, she wasn't just there. Yeah, I know. She wasn't around. Okay. Uh, she was an uh, older student. Yeah, she's about 55, something she like that. She kicked in the better year. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a brief discussion with the department head, and I said, those kids are down there alone. You need to send somebody down there to help them. And he goes, well, what are you doing? So the next morning, 6 a.m., I'm on a flight from, from uh, Salt Lake City to Savannah, Georgia, and um, got to take them all for the rest of the tour. And our, my colleague finally rejoined us after about five days Lift around a lot. Red beard. So um, I say all that to say this. I was just entranced by Savannah. Has it been right there? Yeah. Um, these, these, uh, every other block is a public square. And those public squares go about, uh, they're about 12 blocks, 10 or 12 blocks back. And in and, and every other block, it's like a checkerboard of these public squares. Now it was designed initially to prevent fires, it didn't work. But anyway, uh, I was just entranced, these massive, huge oak trees and brick paving and cobblestones. And I, yeah, I wanted to really get there. And then I realized everything I'm seeing here and enjoying here including the old buildings I'm having to eat at the restaurant, were built by slaves on the back of fortunes built on racist-based slavery. And why would I want to go there and get them from tourists? That's what he really, really struggled with. So um, here's our students, big group of students in one of these public squares with a, a local tour guide who's giving us some information. And, and I decided, I don't want to take them there. So we went to Rome, only to find out that the Colosseum <laughs> was built by Jewish slaves after uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. 100,000 slaves were exported from Palestine to Rome. And the vast majority of them worked on that building in the background that first smiling so after the fight. Anyway. I digress. 
Um, Rome was chronically violent. Their own historian, Tacitus, said, uh, whoops, to plunder, butcher, steal, these things they misname empire. They make a desolation and call it peace. And, and this was not just something that Rome did. This was part of their character. Now, they did not invent crucifixion. The Persians did. And it was Alexander the Great who brought it back from Persia and shared it with the Eastern Med. And it was the Romans who picked it up probably about uh, somewhere around 100 years before Christ. And, uh, and then Constantine put a stop to it in the late... 300s or 400s. So it basically it lasted for just about 500 years in Rome. And it is undoubtedly the, the uh, most painful way a human can die. And this is what Rome became known for. Major roads going in and out of all their cities were lined with crucifixes. Because if you were uh, an escaped slave, a criminal, a Christian, or a disgraced Roman soldier, you could be crucified. And they lined their roads with bodies. Yes, ma'am. I think that was really well. Yeah. And it's why Yeah. And it's why really Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You could define uh, colonialism that way. Tacitus was actually the son-in-law of Caesar, so for him to say this was just like whoa. Okay. Lastly. The context of Rome um, was legitimated by their religious claims. So for the first few hundred years of Rome, they didn't believe the, the well, they didn't have it, right? It was a republic. Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar was the first emperor. He was killed in 44, is that right, 44? 44 BC. By uh, 20, by 42 BC, his uh, nephew, who became Caesar Augustus, uh, deified him and made a temple for him in Forum. And by 29 BC, uh, uh, Caesar Augustus allowed Greek colonies on the Greek peninsula to make temples to him. So not everyone in the Roman Empire was expected, at least implicitly, if not explicitly, to worship Caesar. And like I mentioned earlier, the, the uh, Christians, Christian was a juridical, a juridical term because they didn't believe that the emperor was God. They were fellows. So we have to say that the Jews were given a special dispensation. They were not to worship Caesar. It was part of their being conquered or they're getting along or whatever with the rest of, of the whole, the entire world. Uh, Israel was such an important economic zone worldwide. Everybody crossed, crossed its borders. So the Jews said, or the Romans said, well, let's just give them an out. Yeah. They don't have to sacrifice to Caesar. Right. Go along to get along. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's the context of Rome. Now, in the context of the New Testament or the New Testament canon, uh, canon is a Greek word from the uh, canon or Greek for the Hebrew kane, and it means a measuring stick, a reed or a measuring stick. So when used in connection to the Bible, canon refers to the collection of documents that are acknowledged to be authoritative in the church and by which the church church's faith can be measured. Now, think about this. You're a church leader in a rapidly spreading um, kind of underground group. 
They're all over the map, from Spain to Palestine, to Egypt, North Africa. But you have no social media, no telephones, no telegraphs, no email, no official mail system. How do you connect all these people from all over? How do you get them to all be on the same page? Which is extremely difficult. So, um, and, and, and on top of that, <laughs> the vast majority of church members were poor and didn't read. So you can see why some of the very earliest documents from the Bible are actually Paul's epistles to the Galatians, the Ephesians, the Thessalonians, where he wrote them letters and said, have this read in the church. And then when you're done with it, send it to the next church. So these things circulated all over. And finally, about, it was into the second century, even before all the gospels were written. And uh, finally, at one point, a, a heretic named Marcion said, I'm going to create a canon. Of, I'm going to create a new set of scriptures, which he included in that canon, um, the Gospel of Luke, only the Gospel of Luke, the 10 Pauline letters, uh, and that was it. Now, Marcion was considered a heretic by everybody else, but he goaded them into creating a canon. So later that same century, about 25 years later, they came up with the official canon of the New Testament. How did they do that? Well, they asked the question, is this, this reading, this letter, this document, whatever it is, is it traditionally used in the churches? And please note it's churches, plural. Some little church in a backwater on a hillside in Greece, in Greece is the only one reading that. It doesn't count. We want one that's been read by everybody. Next, it had to be orthodox content. Consistency of doctrine is established by Jesus, the testimony of the apostles in the Old Testament. <clears throat> it has to be a connection to the apostles. You, you've all played telephone, right? That game telephone? Yeah. Well, what happens with quotes about Jesus or quotes about other things is they get passed from person to person to person to person to person to person. By the time it gets down to Carol, who knows what it was actually supposedly said by Keith. So what they did was they said, we want to know, did an apostle write this or one of their disciples of the apostles write this? So there had to be some sort of link back to the apostles. And then relevance to the whole church. Um, there's actually a third epistle of Corinthians. First Corinthians, second Corinthians, third Corinthians. But third Corinthians um, is really instructions just to that church about some picky young stuff that they've been working on. And the people putting together the can said, you know, that applies to the third Corinthians, but it doesn't apply to anybody else. It's not relevant to the whole church. So it had to be relevant to the whole church and then a general belief uh, in their inspiration. Well, how long is the they? A group of bishops, basically. Uh, uh, well, I think it becomes more official around the time of uh, Nicaea. Yeah. Uh, in which the emperor Constantine called the such a diversity of Christians, and he wanted peace in his empire. And, he was, and so he called the bishops all together. That was sort of the first big meeting. And he says, you guys got to make peace with each other and get your act together. But I just want to say a word about the canon. Yeah. And that relates to today, because how many times have you heard somebody will publish something that says, the hidden books of the New Testament. Right. And uh, like the Gospel of Thomas, right. and, and there's other books, and they raise the doubts in our minds and say, "Oh, this is what some old and we assume white guys uh, <laughs> in our modern context decided, and that's the canon, and they didn't like these, and so somehow or other, we're discovering a deeper truth." Right. 
I think that we have to let it be. This is my experience. And I like the fact that the first point there is traditional use by churches. That was the basis by how they decided. Was it being used? Was it benefiting people? Did it bring the gospel home to them? Uh, and that becomes very, very important. Yes. So what are the natural rights that Amazon is damaged? Yeah. 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 No. So who did? It was it was just commonly it, it accepted. Now I mean it did some of those epistles. I mean the bishops out of that. You know, and to the point where, believe it or not, in Luther's day, he considered the canon an open question. This is in the 1500s. And so there was never a time when we always assumed well, there had to be a convention of bishops and they passed this resolution and that's the way it is. Uh, no, this was a development. Uh, that was ongoing, and, and that's why Luther considered the book of James to be questionable uh, as to whether it should be in the canon or not. He, he yeah. legitimately had doubts about that. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a couple of proceedings. Yeah, yeah. Luther um, first dismissed the book of Revelation altogether. Then on his second pass, he made the Pope the, Pope the Antichrist. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I was going to ask if I, I know we're getting away from math of Matthew, but let me just clarify one thing on that one question. So you 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 introduced the term canon, and um, I'm I'm wondering, so is canon the the decision? Is canon the actual body of the of the Bible, or you know, decided this is the Bible, this is true, right. this is the canon? Is that right? Yes. However. However, Protestants have one canon, Catholics have another, and Eastern Orthodox have a third. Oh, okay. Because they all accept different. So it's the uh, approved text. And then the third thing, the second thing I wanted to ask, just, and I know this is probably not related, but in that canon, then at that point in time, was it, were the apocryphal books accepted by Revelation? Many of them were. Especially, uh, well, the, the, the Latin Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Except the Apocrypha. Oh, and it's placed between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah, right. Do you know if the bishops who selected that included or exclude Did they include or exclude females? Um, that's a really good question that I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified to answer. I don't know. By the time that they all met to do this, yes, they excluded females. <laughs> By in the first century, the evidence of the scripture is that every it was including everybody. So, so you have you have people showing up like Prisca or Priscilla, and her name always comes before her husband's name in the Bible. In the Bible, it's Priscilla and Aquila, not Aquila and Priscilla. And uh, Junia is a is named an apostle by yeah. uh, all the book of Romans. So it's it's inclusive in the earliest of Christianity. But very wide. What's that? Very uh, wide. Uh, uh, when you when you read the stories of the martyrs, there were a lot of women heroes. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of ladies that were martyred for their faith and became real heroes in that era. So I don't know um, how it was a, it, it's, dang it, it's, it's been a male dominated world yeah. for a centuries, for forever, ever since some guy left his cave and clubbed a leopard drug and all. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just of interest <clears throat> on this topic, there is a woman's lectionary uh, using the New Testament, I think the Old Testament, and it features um, the stories presented as <clears throat> excuse me, um, will be different than they are in the context, <clears throat> and it focuses on again the stories. <clears throat> okay, so we really want to understand.
understand the difference between canonical order and chronological order. So canonical order, um, you just think about this early group of folks trying to run a church or run a to run Christianity. And uh, they're thinking, we, we, we need to be able to tell our story. Well, what is our story? Well, it starts about Jesus. So, well, let's start with one of the histories. And so the, the, the canonical order is the four histories. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And then history of Acts, the early church. So that's the canonical order and, and the, and the um, uh, most of the stories thereafter are arranged in order of size of the letter itself. Let me interrupt uh, this book. Mary and Early Christian Women was brought to my attention at a recent uh, civic gathering for rostered leaders. And it's just one of many uh, scholarly looks at the earliest of Christianity and the role of women in the earliest of Christian churches. So there's a lot that could be being done on this subject uh, more and more as things are unearthed and they keep more information to keep them deeper and deeper. Shouldn't the book like that be a band of the public <laughs> So they put it together in this canonical order because they're trying to tell a story to the world. Whereas chronological order is a completely different thing. Now, again, I was raised Baptist in a very conservative church. And, and I just figured this was the order of this is how it happened. And that the that Christianity as we know it is a product of the history. And actually it's the other way around. Matthew is likely and the gospels are likely a product of Christianity, not the source of Christianity. Because they weren't written until much later. So chronological order looks at, at um, when, when, what's the best information we have about when things were written. And the earliest are the Pauline epistles somewhere in the mid-50s. So 15 to 20 years after, or 20 to 25 years after Jesus' crucifixion. So Matthew is first in canonical order, but probably 11th or 12th in chronological order. And likely not written by a guy named Matthew. So within the context of the other Gospels, I said this earlier, 90% of Mark is included in Matthew and Luke. There was a, a separate source document called Q or Quell, and then Mark drew on that document, and then Matthew and Luke drew on Mark. And then they just kind of filled in around the edges. Um, again, synoptic uh, means um, together seen or a common perspective. And the Gospel of John really only has about 10% that's included in the Synoptic Gospels. You can see why if you're trying to do a, a good solid um, lectionary that compares everything, you don't want that outlier in there on a regular basis. You don't want John. Which always amazed me when the Lutheran church way back in the day if there was a new believer, they would always say, oh, you need to start with the book of John. That guy's nuts. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. Uh, so the, the order that they were written was Mark first, then Matthew, John, and then finally Luke. And Luke might have been into the 110s, 120s before it was written. So this is in the 50s, these Pauline epistles, Romans, and then maybe in the 70s, the Gospel of Mark, then in the 80s, James, Matthew, Hebrews, John, Ephesians, Revelation, and then even after the turn of the next century, they were still cranking out 
letters. So Jude, John, Second Thessalonians, and then Luke, Acts, Peter, Timothy, Titus, and Second Peter, they think was probably around 130. And I didn't create a column for that. And same with Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians uh, is over here. And then you did uh, oh, in the oh, 50s. Or, or, oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So, very quickly, Tetramorphs, Greek is Tetra 4 and Morphus form. This is Raphael's picture of, of, of Ezekiel's vision. Here's Ezekiel standing here. You see the light coming down, excuse me, receiving the vision. And Here's God the Father being supported by. Okay. Um, there's the eagle with its wings, the man with wings, the ox with wings, and the lion with wings. And it was Irenaeus who at some point in the third or fourth century said, you know, we've got these four epistles, these four gospels, um, and, and clear back in the Old Testament, we got these four creatures. Let's just think of them. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that they should be, or that this is that. It was just uh, uh, Irenaeus. It was a PR study. Yeah. <laughs> but it does explain why you often see Matthew with wings, Mark, the lion, Luke, the ox, and John, the eagle. And there's a reason for every one of them. Now, several different, so Augustine has one listing of these, Irenaeus has another, Jerome has another. Um, and so this is basically, the, the most common one is Jerome's. And you see it in church architecture, in doors, in carvings. This is the, the lid over a baptismal font, ox, eagle, lion, man. The door. There's Jesus. Boom. Peace, bro. <laughs> and there's Luke, John, uh, Mark, and, uh, and Luke. Did I say Luke? Yeah. Matthew, John, Luke, Mark. So here's Andrew's day, the Lamb slain, and the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, Sharp Cathedral, the tympanum over the main doors. There's Jesus. There's Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, John. And same thing here. This is from the illustrated manuscript. Okay. When, when does this end? Yeah. Yeah. It's Okay. I have more. Okay. Next Sunday. Yeah. And, and part of it's already done. <laughs> so that's a great quote. Yeah. yeah, and we'll talk about gospel and law. Mm -hmm. And and Dwayne, this is going by Dwayne's parts of the So we'll talk mm -hmm. about that next week. And then we'll dig into the structure of Matthew, uh, authorship, history, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm.